You might think that I'm hacking my way through the jungles of equatorial Africa on the lookout for Dr. Livingston or somebody, but I'm not. I'm searching for the oldest living thing for miles around. And this must be it. The corroboree tree. Right here on the St Kilda Junction in Melbourne. Not really as jungly as I thought. Melbourne suburb of St Kilda. It's a walk on the city's wild and mild side. I'll shake out some old school ghouls, <laughs> visit the birthplace of a musical generation. This is history, isn't it? I mean, it is modern history, but this is history. And meet up with the suburb's most unusual immigrants. <laughs> oh, I got, I got a real nip there. This is a red gum, it's about 600 years old, and when it was a little seedling, it would have been by a lagoon with lovely fish and lots of things to eat, and it would have been protected from the sea by St Kilda Hill over there. The perfect place for local people to meet up, have their wedding ceremonies or whatever. And then we arrived with our sheep and our alcohol and our horrible diseases and our traffic and by the 1950s, there was nothing left of the lagoon except this. And they even wanted to get rid of that tree to make way for this road. But there was a bit of a fight and the environmentalists won, which is only a small victory, I know, but one worth having, I think, because at least you're still alive, aren't you, darling? <laughs> White settlers probably had their first glimpse of the corroboree tree in the 1840s, and it would have been a glimpse. In those lawless times, you didn't stop to admire the scenery. In the early days, St Kilda wasn't part of Melbourne. It was just a holiday resort that people would go to, a bit like Londoners go down to Brighton today. Now, I know that sounds a bit daft because they're only about six kilometres apart, but the road at that time was so rudimentary that only the rich people could afford the hassle of going down there, which is why the place was peppered with bush rangers. I love this picture. This is supposed to be a bush ranger, and as you can see, he's already killed someone. All the other travellers are looking really scared, but the bush ranger looks so sexy. You can see which side the painter's on. Well, he may have looked fairly sexy, but actually, he only had a very rudimentary plan, which was that he would tie a rope to a tree, he would stop sight. Sorry about this. Do you mind if I, uh, I borrow you for a couple of seconds? Uh, go over there. I, I'm, uh, I'm a bush ranger and you're terrified travellers. That's it, that's it. Just stay where you are. Thank you for your time. Um, now, this may have seemed quite a good strategy, although nowadays it's fairly ludicrous because they're all in lycra and so there's uh, nowhere where they could hide their jewels or their wallets or at least nowhere it would be appropriate for me to, to go. So I'm afraid I'm just going to have to, to leave you here to starve to death. Thank you very much for... Uh, thanks for helping. Uh, good luck. St Kilda's come a long way since then. The dark bush is now lush park, the wheel-busting dirt tracks are now bustling sealed main roads, and the money-hungry bushwhackers have given way to penny-pinching backpackers. What do you do back in England? Uh, I'm an actor, actually. You are the 27-year-old me, only taller and hairy. <laughs> <laughs> so have you got any uh, advice or wisdom for me? Um, I haven't got any of the first, and, <laughs> and I haven't got any of the second either, actually. <laughs> Oh, this is me, actually, yeah. Hey, Coffee Palace. I'll tell you about these places. In the 19th century, there was so much booze around coming out of all these hotels that right. the temperance movement decided they wanted to lure people like you in with, uh, with coffee rather than booze. So there you are. Oh, well, thanks very much. Nice to meet you, Tony. Stay on the wagon, brother. <laughs> Lots of coffee. No gin and tonics. Couldn't afford gin and tonic, could it? 
Just think, 40 years from now, that bloke might be doing what I'm doing, wandering these streets, talking to a camera, and getting in the way of unsuspecting passers-by. Excuse me, love. Uh, this used to be a nursery for, you know, for plants, but at the same time, it was also somewhere where artists made loads of stuff for the outdoors. About 50 artists used to be here, but now all been covered over with concrete and it's just a car park. Nothing left at all. Hippies are rubbish at business, aren't they? Just as well they weren't around 100 years earlier. If they had been, my next port of call up the street might never have been built and St Kilda might never have been developed. This is Eildon House, and it's one of the most important buildings in Australia, let alone St Kilda. It was built by a sheep farmer called John Lang Curry in the 1870s, and it's typical of the kind of house that the squatocracy, as they were known, were building in those days. All right, I know it's architecturally a bit of a mess, if you're being a bit snobbish about it. There's lots of Italian features and Greek features, but basically, this is somebody saying, I am stinking rich and I'm just as smart and just as clever as all those bloody Europeans. And of course, every powerful man dreams of sitting on a throne. I want to show you something now that you don't often see, particularly on television. It's it's in here. It's, uh, it's a bit of a tight squeeze here. Shall I take the, uh, the camera? Now, that is John Lang Curry's dunny. Uh, the reason that that is so significant is because in the late 19th century, Melbourne started to smell. It stank so much, it was known as Smellbourne. They had terrible problems with sanitation. In fact, the newspapers said that the local councillors must have lost their sense of smell, because anyone who could smell anything at all would have realised that the whole situation was intolerable. And this was the result of, of all that fury. Rudimentary piping, plumbing began to be installed. So. That dunny is the beginning of modern hygiene in St Kilda. Actually, while I'm here, uh, I'll be with you in a minute, OK? Oh, sorry, this is rather awkward, isn't it? Tell you what, I'll catch up with you down the road a bit. By the 1860s, the knobs no longer had St Kilda to themselves, thanks to these. Well, steam trains, actually. This is where St Kilda Railway Station was built in Victorian times. Of course, it's long gone now, but you can imagine, can't you, each weekend, thousands of trippers flooding off the train and heading off down to the beach for the Victorian equivalent of ice cream cones and hot dogs and tattoos. Should be another T there, shouldn't there? You wouldn't trust a tattoo artist who couldn't spell, would you? Anyway, all this completely transformed St Kilda. By the end of the 1880s, virtually all of the rich had up sticks and left, and houses like Eildon had either been transformed into apartments or else they'd been knocked down, and big hotels like that one had been put up in their place. When this hotel, the George, was built in 1868, it was considered pretty high for looting, but it's had lots of makeovers since then, not all of them for the better. This is it round about 1970, and that is supposed to stand for This Is The Show. Whether you believe that or not is up to you, but it was definitely a strip joint at that time, and it definitely had acts on the bill like Vanessa the Undresser. I think we can certainly say this was the hotel's low point. This is it. It soon picked up again in the 1970s and 1980s. Rents were very cheap around here, there's a very edgy vibe, and a lot of young people wanted to rebel and do their own thing. So what did they do? They set up band after band after band. 
To Australia's punks and new romantics, St Kilda was the new musical capital of the world. Night after night, they packed out venues like the George Ballroom and pogoed themselves into a scowling, sweaty frenzy. Cool. This really is the faded glory of times past, isn't it? it certainly is. What bands played here? Look, there was many, many bands played, but some of the most notable, I guess, was Boys Next Door with Nick Cave uh, up front. Um, In Excess played here, Midnight Oil. The models, hunters and collectors played their first gig at this hotel. How many people could you squeeze in here? Thousands, thousands. What did you do with all the money? Uh, well, quite often we had to actually what? Stop, what? stuff it down our knickers. <laughs> so you'd walk through all the heaving crowds waddling with all the exactly, cash. Exactly, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> this is history, isn't it? I mean, it is modern history, but this is history. It certainly is. Sweat, all that excitement and the thumping rock music and the money. And now, look at that colossal wreck, empty and bare. Look on my work, she mighty in despair. That's Shelley, by the way. I don't think he ever played in a punk band, but he was a stonking good poet. And now, off round the corner to Grey Street. Which is a bit of a walk on the wild side. There may not be any coloured girls going do to do 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 to do, but it is well known for its ladies of the night and shady characters conducting illicit transactions, if you get my meaning. Today, though, it's pretty quiet. In fact, the only thing that's grabbed my attention is this. A sign for a milk bar. You don't see many of them in Europe. Well, this is what the sign was pointing at, so what's all the fuss about? You know, it's funny. If I was coming into a place like this for the first time, I would expect there to be an actual bar here with milk on it and milk floats and milk shakes and iced lattes, that sort of thing. But there is no milk here at all, apart from a few rows of it in that freezer. And the reason is this. Milk bars were created in the 1930s because the temperance movement wanted to see an alternative to all the booze that was flooding into places like St Kilda. But as the years went on and milk became a much less fashionable drink, people kept the stores open, but the milk became a less important part of them. Until now, they're just general traders with a big sign saying milk bar. You know what I like about St Kilda? One minute you're dodging backpackers, punks and street workers. The next you're walking down broad avenues past pretty little houses with lovely leafy gardens. And before you know it, you've hit trendy Ackland Street, the bustling main drag with its trams and its shoppers and its buskers. This is the fashionable side of St Kilda with its cafe culture and its clothes shops. But originally it was Eastern Europeans who built up this whole area. And of course they brought with them their businesses, including cake shops. And there's only three or four left now, but one of them is preeminent. That's this one, Monarchs. <laughs> This is the original Polish family who set up this business and then they moved out here and they recreated something just like their Polish cake shop. Dan, show me what is special about these cakes. What's that one? That's the Kugelhof. That's the original version from Poland. What does Kugelhof mean? I, I don't really know. It might mean cake with a hole in the side. Ah, cake with a hole in it. That would make sense. Can I have a taste? Yeah, help yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's fantastic. There must be about 100 million calories in this. You <laughs> made these all on the premises? Yeah, down in the bakery. Do you want to have a look? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Here's some Ooh, cupcakes. cupcakes too. Uh -huh. You've already had a cake. <laughs> Thank you. This way. No, no. That's the kugel I've been made. That's Brad, our chef. Hi, Brad. Hi. So how do you make a kugel hot? Well, look, there's some secret family stuff that we can't really tell you, which is a Are you serious? Yeah. You might want to have a go. Oh, I'd love to have a go. Yeah. it around. Spide it around, out like that. Whee! And then some of these can go Rather nice, that. Oh, you can put go that in the oven. There. Oh. Whee! I've made my very first Kugelhof. And I'm not telling you the secrets. I don't know about you, but St Kilda's rather tickling my fancy. After all, I've been able to fake a wallet take, take a toilet break, and bake a secret cake. And there's more where that came from. Stories, that is, not words rhyming with ache. Once the railway had arrived in St Kilda, and 20 years after that, the cable tram, this whole area was transformed into a huge amusement zone. There were cinemas and ice skating rinks and ballrooms and the old Palais Theatre over there, and one building that has got the most famous and scariest entrance in the whole of St Kilda, with its big staring eyes and its great cavernous mouth. Luna Park. Walk through this gate and you're walking through time. When this place opened a century ago, the first nighters ooed at tightrope walkers, aahed at strong men, and screamed their proverbials off on the roller coaster. Nothing says Luna Park like this ride. Back then, it was the splash mountain of its time. These days, it's a quaint reminder of a bygone era, the oldest continually operating roller coaster in the world. And I've got it all to myself, which should make it a bit special. I say should, because actually, it doesn't. All the rattles, bumps, twists, turns and drops are still there. But they just aren't the same without the ear-piercing squeals of your fellow passengers. Still, there is one advantage to having the key to this place. I get to see it, warts and all. Now, this is the ghost train like most people never see it. The ghost train is really culty. People go out to dinner and have their, their, their wine and their food, and then they come especially to Luna Park to do two things, to go on the scenic railway and to come on the ghost train. And look at this stuff. It looks like something out of a fetish house rather than a ghost train, doesn't it? In the old days, there used to be a bloke hiding here in the dark, and as the railway came past, he'd go... <laughs> <laughs> and everyone would go... Aah! But people aren't allowed to stand here anymore. I think it's a health and safety thing or something. Sad, really, isn't it? But one thing I've learned that did make me smile is that the workers of Australia have a majority share in Luna Park because the union pension funds have invested a lot of money in it. So this bloke, apart from having a big face, should also have a big fist coming out of the side like that. I wonder why no one's ever thought of that before. just started spitting with rain, which is fairly annoying. And I was going to go straight down to the beach, but when I was up on the scenic railway, I spotted this place, and I thought, whatever's that? And I'm so glad I came here. Look, it's called Veg Out, and it's, it's totally mad, look. Place. Hey, 
Rob, right. is this your plot? Ah, oh, it's not. It's a mate of mine, so I'm just uh, getting some of his weeds out for him. How long has this place been here? Uh, community garden. I think uh, next week it'll be 13 years. It was a bowling club for about 70 years. Uh, it's a bowling club shape, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and these are the old club rooms. You see the yeah. old lamps. We've had World Series gardening here when we turn them on. Yeah. <laughs> How did it turn into a series of gardens? Well, it was, the bowling club, um, it kind of died out, I guess, in about 94, 95, and it was empty for a year or two. And the local council foolishly let us come in and plant some sunflowers. Yeah, and that's 13 years ago. We just thought, well, I we think that's a good idea, a community garden, so let's try and make it permanent. How come the stuff in it is so weird? Why isn't it just plants and...? Well, you know, it just makes it more kind of enchanting, and a lot of people just come here and have a cup of tea or have a barbecue, and their experience here is as relevant as, you know, silly old Lenny digging in the garden over there. You Lenny! Know, like... yeah. <laughs> come and have a chat. <laughs> Kate. Okay. I need a rest no, anyway. don't stop him working, mate. He don't, <laughs> it's hard enough to get him going. <laughs> I need a rest. How long have you had a plot here? Uh, gone 12 years now. It's good to get out of the flat, not watching telly. And if you've got a, if you've got a wife or a girlfriend home, you don't get on too well, you say, I've gone back to the garden. So it's a good excuse to get out of you know, get out of the flat. So it saves relationships, so, Yeah, that's place. it. Oh, sorry. Oh, not really. <laughs> 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 got, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we'll go there. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> See ya. Is that what you call gardening? Oh, yes, we're <laughs> right. Who <laughs> was that? And just like that, the sun comes back out. Hey, this is Melbourne weather. And the markets along the St Kilda Esplanade are filled with people. By the 1860s, there were about 15 residential hotels all along here. And in front of one of them, the Royal Hotel, um, a little old lady used to come every day. She was called Granny. No one knew her real name. And she had a basket, and she used to sell lollies and oranges. Little lolly, love. Oh, thank you. That's right. It'll be a penny. An old penny. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't really much of a business, as you can imagine. But after about a year, the bloke who owned the Royal Hotel... Hello, how do you do? Hi, hi, Tony. Hello, there just telling a story, all right? Yeah, yeah. Um, after about a year, this bloke took pity on her and he bought an awning and he tied it to a tree and said that Granny could work from there. And so she did, she did very well. Look, I'm transforming myself into Granny. Amazing, isn't it? Uh, yeah, a storm came, whoosh, and it blew down the awning, blew down the tree, damaged the hotels. It seemed as though Granny's time was up, but it wasn't, because by that time, she was so famous, so celebrated amongst the local people that they had a charity concert and they raised so much money that uh, Granny was able to afford to buy a brand new shop. Granny lives again. And for 10 years, she operated out of that shop. And when she died, they knocked it down because everybody said that nobody could run a shop like Granny. I think that's really sweet, don't you? I don't think this suits me really, do you? <laughs> Thanks anyway. <laughs> St Kilda's iconic beach is my last stop. I'm not here to soak up the rays, though. In fact, just the opposite. This walk is finishing when the sun goes down and some tiny stars come out. I've just come all the way up that long pier and hopefully I've saved the best till last. I've got privileged access tonight in order to see some of St Kilda's most distinguished residents. Tiana, I'm hearing all these noises. Have you got something? I sure do. Did you want to come and have a look? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, if you pop down yes, here, you. just have a look underneath that. In rock. here? Yep, under there. It's a... Oh! Little penguins. You're very small to have made such a big noise. What are you going to do? I'm going to weigh them in a minute. Did you want to help? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do they nip you? Yes, they sure do. It's blue! 
They're very blue, these guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you mean. Yeah, it's nice and blue. It's actually just about ready to go out to sea. So we're going to weigh it now to see that it's heavy enough to look after itself when it gets out into the bag. Oh, it's pooing, isn't it? It sure is. <laughs> there we go. Come on. It's all right. Not nice and wide. And we'll... Oh! Oh, sorry. <laughs> I got a real nib then. Ooh, you little terror. This one is almost dead on a kilogram. Yep. They all live on this spit here. Yep. When was it built? Uh, it was built for the 56 Melbourne Olympic Games. So they must have come after that? Yeah, exactly right. Where do you think they came from? Uh, we think that was Phillip Island because the penguins from there, they used the bay to feed in. And how many have you got now? Uh, around about 1,000. But very few people know about them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's a, it's a little hidden secret that we've got in St Kilda. Well, thank you for letting me see it. What a lovely way to end a walk. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you, St Kilda, for your flora, fauna, subcultures, new cultures, fun parks, greenies and grannies. I really love St Kilda. It's so varied from the corroboree tree to the punk rockers. And all right, it does have its seamy side, everyone knows that. But the fact that a thousand penguins have recolonised it in bird's eye view of the city of Melbourne puts a bit of a smile on my face. Hi, I'm Tony Robinson. If you love my show and want to see some more amazing history stories, then please hit the subscribe button, click the notification bell, and we'll let you know when there's something new to watch. Enjoy.